Hey, it's Heather from the THQ Youth Department, and welcome to WII Light Week 3. I hope over the last couple of weeks, as you've experienced any confusion, uncertainty, or maybe downright darkness, that you've taken time to invite the light of Jesus into your life. I've really been missing WII, and I think it's because my favorite part of WII is the fact that we get to come together and we get to connect. I think my favorite moments are cabin wars when we're all in an octagon downing some crazy spicy wings. And it's actually not what's happening in the octagon, but when we look out and we see the cabins joining together and excited, cheering each other on, and that's that camaraderie. I miss that, and I think it's one of my favorite things. Before we hear from Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Smith, let's go ahead and dive into scripture. Feel free to join me in reading 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 through 18, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. It says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. 2 Corinthians goes on to say, It is God himself, in his mercy, who has given us this wonderful work of telling his good news to others, and so we never give up. We do not try to trick people into believing. We are not interested in fooling anyone. We never try to get anyone to believe that the Bible teaches what it doesn't. All such shameful methods we forgo. We stand in the presence of God as we speak, and so we tell the truth, as all who know us will agree. If the good news we preach is hidden to anyone, it is hidden from the one who is on the road to eternal death. Satan, who is the god of this evil world, has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining upon him, or to understand the amazing message we preach about the glory of Christ, who is God. We don't go around preaching about ourselves, but about a Christ Jesus as Lord. All we say of ourselves is that we are your slaves because of what Jesus has done for us. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made us understand that it is the brightness of his glory that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. But this precious treasure, this light and power that now shine within us, is held in a perishable container, that is, our weak bodies. Everyone can see that the glorious power within must be from God and is not our own. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time to worship together, no matter the distance, no matter how far we are. Just grateful for this time to join together as a body of believers, coming and worshiping you, bringing you praise, honor, and glory for who you are, what you've done for us in our lives. God, as we ponder this idea of community today, I pray that you will um, really stir up in our hearts this idea of coming together as believers and joining as your church, your body. God, help us to be like the church from from Acts that uh, came together and studied scripture together and, and did everything together and gave up everything for each other and really bonded so closely uh, as one. God, we pray that within our communities, you will um, help us to be a light to those around us. God, that in our activities that we do as the church, that they're inclusive of those outside of the church, that will be welcoming them into this community um, so that they can feel like they're a part, God. We pray that you'll give us ministry opportunities, that you'll give us opportunity to witness, um, whether it be through our words or through our actions. God, we just pray that you will give us those chances, that you'll bring those opportunities forward to us, and that we will be aware when you do give them to us, God. Lord, pray uh, for harmony within the body, that you will really help us to work as one, that there won't be a division or infighting, God, but that we will be working cohesively together as your body, the hands, the feet, the mouths, the eyes, the the head, all those different parts that go together. Pray that we'll be working together as one. And God, lastly, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for being a God who, who has loved us so much through so many different things. God, as we um, strive to be your people, to uh, continue to conform into that image that you created us in, we pray that you will be working in our hearts individually. Because God, I think before we can truly come together as community and be a light into our community, 
we have to have that foundation with you. We have to have that relationship with you. So God, please help us in our relationships to really strive to be like Jesus. God, to meet with you on a daily basis. God, to be looking into your word, studying your scripture, really trying to find out what it means for us and how we live it out. We love you so much, Father. We thank you for this body of believers. We thank you for this WII. And we pray that you will be speaking into our hearts tonight. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to the WI News, a place where you get one minute of Salvation Army news that will have you crying for reasons we can't guarantee are happy or sad. The Salvation Army Hawaiian and Pacific Islands Division announced that recently they received donations of over 20,000 pounds of beef from members of the Hawaiian Cattlemen's Council, located on Kauai, Hawaii, Maui, and Oahu. The beef donations are helping to provide protein for thousands of prepared meals being distributed by the Salvation Army to those in need during the pandemic. That's a pretty generous donation. And now we could truly say that the Hawaiians are saved to serve beef. Speaking of beef, cadets are moving into Christmas soon. For those of you who don't know what a cadet is, cadets are people who are entering the Salvation Army training school to be Salvation Army officers. The incoming class was a top rated class according to ESPN. Crestmont will open the season as a preseason favorite to take the championship away from the Eastern Territory. When asked about the season, Major Cross said, We feel confident that we will get back to our winning ways. We have upgraded our exegesis squad and hired a new sentence diagramming coach. We trust our analytics and at the end of the season, our territory will be able to raise our hands in the sanctuary. Go team! The pandemic has no doubt been awful, but there have been good things that have come of it whether it be innovative approaches to ministry or new social norms. We want to highlight a few things we hope to stay. Number one, use of app technologies. From core directories to weekly tithing, we can use apps now to help us out. Soon maybe we won't have to sit in a pool of guilt when the sergeant major is waiting for you to find three dimes in your pocket while he's holding the offering plate right in front of your face. Number two, writing cards to each other. This helps keep community outside the four walls of our church. It also reminds you of those who go to the core and maybe not in your social circles. For example, my mom sent me a card and it was great to hear from her. Totally forgot she goes to the core with me. Number three, use technology to do small groups. This allows for people to meet where they are. It also saves you from using your small group leader's bathroom. We all have a joke or story that we can share, so not much to say other than Sorry, Derek, I'm really sorry. Tip number four, food pantries and other means that serve people. We saw a wave of people helping each other. That's what the church should be. Let's not lose this practice. And for those asking, I like maple donuts, my lawn mowed, and did I mention I need a babysitter? Our final tip is community. In many ways, we have all grown closer to each other. Neighbors have talked with each other, church members have followed up with each other, and even the praise and worship leader and bandmaster had settled their beef. We're not talking Hawaiian beef, the real beef. Ladies and gents, this has been another episode of the WI News. I trust that you got as much out of this as I would watching Rhythm Ribbon Gymnastics in the Olympics. Be sure to check us out on most social platforms at Say Network, and be sure to subscribe to the Say Network podcast found on any podcasting service. Good night. During the first century, when the Romans ruled the known world, a grassroots countercultural movement was born in the eastern end of the empire. Yeah, it started among the Jewish people. Who for centuries now have been scattered around the known world. But no matter where they lived or what language they spoke, they kept their identity as the family of Abraham, devoted to the one true God. And every year, they would travel to Jerusalem for sacred festivals. And during one of these, the Feast of Pentecost, the visitors encountered a group of Jews who could somehow speak in everyone's native dialect. Yeah, they were telling stories about a man named Jesus who had been executed by the Romans. 
They claimed he had risen from the dead and was now exalted as the true king of Israel and the whole world. And this Jesus was now calling people to adopt his upside down set of values and live under his rule called the kingdom of God. And thousands of Jews decided to stay in Jerusalem and join the movement. It grew in size and in influence and gained favor with people. But not with the Jerusalem temple leaders. They viewed this whole thing as a dangerous religious sect, and they even executed one of its leaders named Stephen. It's no longer safe in Jerusalem, and so most of the followers flee for the outlying land called Judea. And you might think that's the end of the story, but actually this tragedy became the way the movement spread outside Jerusalem. That's where the second part of the book of Acts begins. The scattered followers end up in surprising places, like Samaria, where their ancient enemies live. Yeah, and Luke shows us how all of these unexpected people start following Jesus, like a sorcerer from Samaria who has to learn that the way of Jesus isn't about gaining power, but giving it up to serve others. There's also a story about an Ethiopian delegate who, after discussing the scroll of the prophet Isaiah with Philip, decides to join the movement. Yeah, Jesus is expanding his movement out into Judea and Samaria, just like he said he would. Which is great. But back in Jerusalem, we meet Saul of Tarsus. He's part of the religious elite who oppose the new movement, and he's finding and arresting Jesus' followers anywhere he can. This is a cruel guy. But think about it from his perspective. In the past, Israel had turned away to other gods and to false prophets, leading to disaster. He believed he was protecting Israel and God's honor by getting rid of these people. And then Saul hears that the movement spread north to Damascus. So he sets out there to find and arrest more followers. And on the way, Saul has this sudden encounter with the risen Jesus himself. Jesus asked Saul why he's fighting against him. And then Jesus commissioned Saul to now represent him to Israel and to the nations. And Saul is stunned and speechless. And so he ends up in Damascus, but now he's announcing the good news about the Jesus he had just been attacking. And no one saw this coming. Totally. And the same goes for what happened next. Over in the port city of Caesarea, there was a Roman centurion named Cornelius, and he represents everything the Jewish people would hate about the Roman occupation. An angel appears to him, and he tells him to call for a man named Peter. So Peter comes and he finds Cornelius and his friends and his family all gathered together in his home. Yeah, and this is scandalous. Jewish people don't enter a non-Jewish home to avoid ritual impurity. So what's Peter gonna do? Well, right before this, Peter had a vision. God brought to him a collection of animals that his people were forbidden to eat. And then God said to Peter, eat these. And this is shocking to Peter. He says, I've never eaten anything impure. And God responds, don't call impure what I have made pure. And then that's it, the vision was over. So Peter's gonna start a new diet? No, he's an Israelite, and he's honored these customary food laws his entire life. The vision was preparing him for this moment of him standing among impure non-Israelites. And he realizes that God is declaring these people are a part of the family of Abraham. And so Peter decides to stay and tell them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit shows up just as he did at Pentecost, but now it's for a Roman centurion and his non-Jewish family. The movement is broken out. And so back in Jerusalem, Peter is now telling the other apostles about what happened, and they start getting reports about even more non-Jewish people following Jesus up in the big trade city north called Antioch. So they send a man there named Barnabas to check things out. Barnabas finds the Jesus movement alive and well in Antioch, and he finds it's made up of people from all over the world. And so Barnabas recruits Saul to come and work with him in Antioch for a year. They're teaching, living among the people there, watching the movement grow. The church in Antioch was the first international Jesus community, and it is where Jesus' followers were first called Christians, the Christ ones. And so the way of Jesus was transformed from a group of Messianic Jews in Jerusalem into the multi-ethnic Jesus movement spreading through the world. Their faith was the same. It was centered on the good news about the crucified Jesus who is the king of all nations. But that message and their new way of life was confusing, even threatening to the average Roman citizen living around them. And the resulting conflict is what we'll explore next as this movement goes global, or as Jesus said, to the ends of the earth.
writer, Psalm, the psalmist says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. And guess what? That's exactly what we're going to do tonight. So I want to encourage you to use your hands, use your feet. If you feel like dancing for Christ, we're going to do exactly that. Um, So let loose. We're going to start off with uh, Lord, You Are Good, a song that we are all familiar with. So rise to your feet. Get those hands clapping, hands lifted up, and those feet stomping. We're going to praise Him because He is good. Amen.
One of the most remarkable things Jesus said came during his Sermon on the Mount. From Matthew 5, we know that there were large crowds that followed Jesus. And when he saw these large crowds, one time he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And in the middle of that sermon, he said these remarkable words, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus said, you, you disciple of Christ, you are the light of the world. But the scriptures up until that point always said that it was God or, or, or Christ that was the light. You, you look at the um, Psalms and it talks about God being our light. It, you look at the prophecies about Messiah and, and the prophecies say, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Even speaking of himself in John's gospel, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. So what does he mean when he says you are the light? You know, I have here a replica of a lantern from Bible times. This is very similar to what they would have used in the homes in, in Jesus's day. Just a clay pot, not impressive. Um, just a vessel made out of pottery. Um, it has a hole so that you can fill it with oil. But, it, but right now, we would call this a lantern, a lamp, a light, but it, it's not giving off any light at all. The ancient lamps of the Bible times needed oil and fire added to it to make it give light. Fuel and fire gives us a light that will last and will be helpful so that we can see when it's dark. The key here is that we need some oil. We need to get some oil in that lamp and light that lamp. And that, that oil is representing the, the Spirit of God that comes into us when we are those vessels that are filled with the treasure of the living Christ. It's like the oil that fills the lamp. We ask to be filled with that Spirit and the oil fuels the flame of God, His power, His healing, His anointing upon our lives for powerful ministry. Of course, we don't trust in ourselves, in this clay pot that we are. We trust in the presence of Christ in our lives. We have no light of our own. We need God to fill us and the fire of the Holy Spirit to come upon us in, in power. John the Baptist understood that when he told his followers, when they, when they asked him, he said, I'm not the light. I am here to bear witness to the one who is the light. And he was talking about Jesus. That's why Paul prayed for the Ephesian believers. When he, when he prayed for them, he said, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that they would know the love, that light and love that surpasses knowledge, that they would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's what we need to do as, as carriers, as lamps and lights for God. So how does this light of Christ shine in us for the world to see? How do we break into the darkness of this world with that light of Christ? And what does it look like to be the light of the world as Christ invites us to? I mean, this world is a dark place. There's so much darkness. When you look at, at the poverty and the hatred and the division and the anger and, the, and just so many things that, that can, can cause us to despair. How do, we, how do we bring the light to that place? I think it's so important to know that, that darkness is not the opposite of light. Actually, darkness is the absence of light. They're not two equal opposing forces. Darkness is the absence of light, absence of light. And when the light comes in, it dispels the darkness. The light demolishes the darkness. I want to tell you the story of Mariah Morris. She is a woman from New Zealand. She lived in the late 1800s, and uh, she was half European and half Maori. Um, half um, of her was from the indigenous people of New Zealand. She lived in a village um, of, of Maori people and married a young chief of that village. Um, she had the horrible experience of a terrible loss when, when a Maori dissident named Tikuti came to their village and killed her husband in front of her. 
she was devastated. He was going to kill her and her son as well, but they somehow escaped. But as she wiped her hands in her husband's blood, Maria vowed that she would not rest until she had taken the life of that man who had killed her husband. For 17 years, vengeance consumed her. She searched everywhere for this man, vowing to take his life. She eventually returned to the, the town of Gisborne and found herself in that city when the Salvation Army showed up and opened fire and began their work there. Now, she, as a child, had learned the Bible and had learned to pray, but all that had but disappeared as she, she was in, in consumed with vengeance and with the desire to, to find Tekuti to kill him. She heard Captain Ernest Holdaway there in the streets reading the scriptures, and it reminded her of what she had learned as a child, and that glimmer of light started to break through to her heart. She kept running into Salvationists throughout the town. Someone handed her a war cry. She saw the captain again at her neighbor's house. He asked her, do you love God? Are, are you a Christian? And she, she said, no, I'm a heathen. Um, eventually, it led her to go to the Salvation Army meeting 26 days after they had started, after they opened fire. She came forward in that altar call and she knelt at the front. And she said, everyone prayed for me but my heart was stubborn. And she went home and she prayed and she had a miserable week because she couldn't get rid of, of that, that vengeance and, and, and the, the turmoil in her heart, the darkness in her heart. The captain came around to talk to her and she told the captain of the story of her husband's death and he saw that she was angry. He asked me, Mariah says, if I could forgive Takuti for Jesus' sake. And I said, no. Then the captain prayed for me to have the power to forgive my enemies. And at, all at once, a light broke in upon me and I cried for forgiveness. I pardoned Tekuti in my heart and I felt my own sins were forgiven from that moment on and I knew I was saved. After this, I was so happy. I began to understand my Bible, she said. I read the hymns and I prayed constantly. You know, we become the light of the world when we allow the light of God to dispel the darkness in our own lives. She had vengeance and hatred and bitterness in her life, but the light of Christ broke through to deliver her from the stronghold of that desire for revenge. There's a lot of things that can hold us back these days, our, the stronghold of, of addictions that would bind us up, or maybe our own um, hatred or, or, or anger at something. I don't know what it is in your life. Maybe there's something that's, that feels like darkness in your life. Maybe you need delivery from your own wounds that need healing. The light of Christ can transform you like he transformed Mariah Morris. She was a miracle. In that town of Gisborne, she became highly respected and joined the Salvation Army in radiated light. You could see her distinctive moku on her chin, which is the tattoo that the Maori women always always wore. And there she would be in her Salvation Army uniform, that moku on her chin and her Bible in her hand, telling her story over and over again about how the light of Christ broke through into her heart and helped her to forgive an enemy. She was used mightily in New Zealand to help the Maori people come to Jesus. And she was truly a light in her world. We become a light in our world when we allow the light of God to dispel the darkness within us, but also when we allow the light of Christ to dispel the darkness around us in our communities. This happens when we give our gifts and our, and our God-given talents to God and allow him to use what he's given us to help the world, to drive out the world's darkness of injustice, um, anger and war and, and, and division, the, the injustice of trafficking and poverty, and we replace that darkness with the light of God's love, justice, salvation, and abundance. You know, another story I love is the story of Elizabeth Cottrell. She, um, her story happens maybe just a few years after um, Mariah Morris's. She was not in New Zealand. She was in London in the early days of the army, ministering in that rough part of East London. Poverty all around, people caught in addiction to alcohol, women prostituting themselves in order to survive. This what, these were the people that the army was ministering to. And Elizabeth Cottrell was a soldier that was part of that ministry. She would 
um, go to the army meetings and when women caught in prostitution would come forward to pray and receive forgiveness and salvation, Elizabeth would pray with them and counsel them. And, and they would say, I don't want to be a, a prostitute anymore. I don't want to go back to that life. I don't want to go back to that brothel. And so what would she do? What could she do? She was a housewife herself. She had kids and a husband at home, but these women needed her help. And so she brought them to her own home. Her own home became a shelter where they slept. These prostituted women slept on her kitchen floor. After a while, when her husband had to tiptoe over the bodies of sleeping women because they covered the floor of the kitchen on his way to work in the morning, uh, she went to the army leadership and said, ah, we need some funds here. We need a building. We need a place to have a shelter for trafficked women. I believe that Elizabeth Cottrell's work was the first anti-trafficking work done by the army. It wasn't a mandate from THQ or DHQ. It wasn't a corps officer telling everybody what to do. No, this was a soldier who ministered out of the light that was in her own life to bring light into the darkness of someone else. The light that came to these women who were transformed and changed because of her ministry. We become the light of the world when we allow the light of God to dispel the darkness around us, the darkness in our neighborhoods, in our communities. I wonder when you think about your own world, where would God want you to bring the light of God. 2 Corinthians 4 was our scripture reading earlier. It said this, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that's seen in the face of Christ Jesus. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves, are like fragile clay jars containing this treasure. And this makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. Those are Paul's words saying that we are like these clay pots full of the treasure that is the Spirit of God. Jesus told another parable in Matthew 25. And this parable was, was a parable he used to try and um, remind people that they need to be ready for when he comes back and returns. But it also is an interesting parable because it also talks about lamps. I don't know if you remember this parable, the parable of the 10 virgins. Um, in Bible times, the weddings were done a little differently than we do them today. Um, the groom would come to the bride's house and bring the bride back to his house for the wedding feast. And the bride would be waiting at her house with all of her attendants. And so these 10 virgins would be the attendants of the bride waiting at the house for the groom. Now in this parable, Jesus said the groom was late the groom was late, and so they, they were waiting. Now their responsibility as the attendants was to have lamps that would last for the journey back to the groom's house for the wedding feast. So um, the Bible says there were five wise attendants and five unwise attendants, foolish attendants. The wise ones had their lamps and they burned their own lamps, but they also had some extra oil. They were ready for a long journey over to the, the groom's house for the wedding feast. But the foolish attendants, they had their lamps, but they noticed the oil was getting low and they started to worry because the groom was coming and they had not enough oil to get them back to his home. So they asked the wise attendants, please give us some of your oil. And they said, we, we can't give you our oil. We won't have any oil left. We won't have enough to get through our journey you need to go buy your own oil. And so they left to buy oil. And sure enough, while they were gone buying oil, the groom came and took the five wise attendants with him and they went back for the wedding feast. And the foolish attendants missed out. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. You know, um, T.D. Jakes preached on this parable and he brought it to this point. He said this, he says, there's nothing worse than the regret that comes from getting serious too late. The foolish attendants weren't prepared. They hadn't prioritized what they needed to do to make sure they would be with the bridegroom at that wedding feast. 
And I think when it comes to us, when we're talking about ourselves and being filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing worse than the regret that comes from getting serious about your relationship with God too late. No one can be serious about your relationship with God for you. That's your job. That's my job. We each have to take our relationship with God seriously and prioritize Him. You can't borrow someone else's relationship with God or someone else's intimacy with the Savior. That only happens when we take the time to prioritize Christ and eternal things in our own lives. There's a lot that will distract you. Binge watching Netflix or video games or, or doing the things that are important to you, getting that education, all these things, good things, neutral things, but the most important thing is Christ and His kingdom. And God has called us to be a light and to do that, we have to fill ourselves with Him and get our own oil. So my challenge to you and my, my prayer for you right now is that as we finish, I want to ask you to go and get your own oil. If you want to indicate to me that you want to make this commitment today to, to, to get your own oil, to prioritize Christ and His kingdom as foremost of foremost importance in your life, then I want you to um, email me at lisa.smith at uswsalvationarmy.org and I will send you a little bottle of oil that you can place on your shelf and you can use it to remind you to go get your oil and to make sure you are full of Christ. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's my prayer for you and for me, that we would shine brightly for him. God bless you.